Hello everyone, my name is Andrew McNally and I'm an Applied Mathematics major at Augustana College and today I'm going to be talking about using ordinary differential equations to model drug concentrations within the field of pharmacokinetics. So pharmacokinetics is actually a branch of pharmacology and more specifically it's the study of a drug's actions as it passes through the body. Um, and we can use ordinary differential equations to model different types of injections that patients might receive. And by doing so, we're able to determine the amount of the drugs within the body of the patient at any given time. So today, for um, our example, we're going to be looking at multiple injection models. And this is a case where the patient would be receiving um, any type of injection over a fixed interval of time. So they would get their injection and then nothing would happen and then they might get their second injection and this would happen over um, an expansion of time. And so um, one of the ways we can look at this is through this um, second bullet point here where dBe over dt is equal to f of t minus alpha bt. And here what this is saying is that um, the change in the amount within the blood is, pro is proportional to um, this injection that happens, which is f of t, um, subtracted by the t the amount of, that is leaving um, at that at that certain time, and so if f of t was equal to zero, we would essentially have an exponential decay function because the drug would just be leaving. Um, but because we have this f of t, it becomes a multiple injection model. And to solve this, we're going to use the Laplace transform as well as a few other um, things. So before I get into how to solve, I'm just going to go over a few things we'll be using throughout these solving these equations. So the first is the Laplace transform. And the Laplace transform is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st times f of t dt. And this is given that the integral converges. And this means that f of t can't grow larger than that e to the negative st. Um, they need to grow either f of t needs to grow slower or at the same rate. <clears throat> Another way to think of this is that um, the Laplace transform of little f of t is equal to this big F in terms of s. And here, um, s would be our uh, frequency space. So we're going from little f of t, which is in terms of time, to big F of s, where s is a frequency space. So you could take the Laplace transform of a bunch of different functions, and people have done this and actually generated tables. And that's what we'll be using for the majority of this, um, this video. And you can feel free to refer back to this or to um, use the link that I've included below in the comments. Another thing we're going to talk about is the step function, and this is denoted by u of t. So a way to think of this is that any time before um, time 0, we're going to get a value of 0 for this function. But then when time is greater than 0, we get a value of 1. And that's what this graph is depicting. Um, it's kind of taking a step up, kind of looks like a step. And we're increasing in the value of this function. And so when we use this later, you can think of this as basically a function that turns on other functions because now it's giving it a value, whereas before it didn't. Um, and this will come in handy later on when we're solving. It's also interesting to note that the derivative of the step function is the delta function. So the Dirac delta function is um, a linear functional from a space of test functions f. The action of delta on f gives us the value of 0 of f at any function f. And so basically what we're saying, um, the definition is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of g of t times um, the delta of t minus a dt is equal to g of a. And so what we did was um, we plugged in that a in the delta t minus a, which was indicating a shift, um, into that g of t. So we're getting this a in our function, and um, we can use that to solve with all of the delta functions. Another way to think of this is that um, when time is not equal to zero, we're going to get a value of zero. But the moment that time equals zero, that split um, instant, we're going to get a value that skyrockets into infinity. And that's why 
The delta function is also known as the impulse function because as you can see in this graph, there's kind of like an impulse where um, t is equal to zero. And also we should note that the area underneath there is always going to be equal to one. And so when we're talking about um, the delta function t of t minus a, what this is implying is just a shift in where the impulse occurs. So now instead of the impulse occurring at zero, it can happen at time a. So for our sakes, when we're solving, remember we said f of t was the injections that are coming in, and we can model this actually um, by a series of delta functions. So the first portion where we have a sub 1 in this equation, that would essentially be the first injection that occurs. And then a sub 2 would be where the second injection occurs. So we're getting these impulses of drug amounts um, that will eventually decay later on when we solve this. So here, our n is the dosage number, and a sub n is the time that the dose is administered. And you can think of like a sub 1 as being um, hour number 1 that the dosage is given, and a sub 2 would be um, the second hour that the dosage is given. So the process we're going to use to solve this is um, as follows. Taking the Laplace transform of this ODE, so that we get a function big B in terms of S. And once we do that, we can manipulate it algebraically um, so that we're, we can actually take the inverse Laplace transform of B of S to get us little b of t, which will tell us the amount of the drug at any given time, which is what our end goal is. So to start off, we look back at that equation um, on the third slide. And we're going to take the Laplace transform of both sides of this equation. So we do that. Um, when you look at the right-hand side, by linearity properties of the Laplace transform, we can actually take the Laplace transform of just f of t and just b of t, and then also pull out that alpha and the b of t. All right, so right now we're going to look at the left-hand side, and I'm actually going to go through how we use the Laplace transform to solve. And then from here on out, after that, we're going to use the table that I had referred to earlier just to make it quicker. Um, but we plug in our B of T, our, excuse me, our DBDT um, into our definition of the Laplace transform to get the integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative st times db dt dt. And so a way to solve this integral is by doing integration by parts. So um, this first one is a little fresher. This first equation is a little refresher about how integration of part by parts goes. So we want to find, um, or we want to set u and v prime um, variables for, from our integral before. So I let u equal e to the negative st and v prime equal db dt dt. And then we just take the derivative of um, u and the antiderivative of v to get those values um, below. Now we can plug these back into our uh, equation for integration by parts and then evaluate. And so the second to last line was actually the evaluation. So when we evaluate e to the negative st b, uh, b of t, where t equals infinity, that we're going to get a value of 0 there. And then when we evaluate when t equals 0, that exponential is going to become 1, and then we're just left with a negative b of 0. And then when we look at the second part of this, we take out s, and we see that what we have here is actually just the definition of the Laplace transform. So we, when we evaluate it, we actually get just this big B in terms of S, and then we can multiply times S. When we add those two together, um, we get this equation here, the, the solution here in yellow, and that's actually number 35 on the Laplace transform um, table. And here B is our new function, and B, sub zero, or B of 0 is our initial amount of the drug that's given. So now when we're looking at the right-hand side, remember I said that f of t is going to be defined as a discrete pulse function or the series of delta functions. So once I plugged in um, f of t of a series of delta functions into the Laplace transform portion of it, um, I got this bottom equation. 
So when we're taking the Laplace transform of the delta function, we need to recall both the definition of the Laplace transform and also the definition of the delta function. And so when we take the Laplace transform of the delta function we, and we plug in um, delta of t minus a, we actually get an integral that looks very similar to um, the definition of the delta function. So when we solve, um, just as we had during the delta function, we can plug in this shift of a into um, our function g of t, which essentially just gives us e to the negative um, a s. And uh, good enough, it actually turns out to be 26 on our Laplace transform table. So I ended up just doing that for all of our a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way up to a sub n and um, substituted those in. And then when we take the Laplace transform of um, b of t, just by the definition, we know that, again, we get this big function b, and I multiplied that times the um, alpha on the outside. So now we're at the part where we have b in terms of s, and we need to manipulate it um, algebraically to get all the b's on the left-hand side and all the s's on the right-hand side. So I just added um, b of 0 to the other side, and I, add, and I added um, alpha times b to the other side. That's our second step here. And then in our third step, I uh, factored out b on the left-hand side, and then I divided both sides by the quantity s plus alpha, and that gives us um, our final solution, which is the last line of this slide. So now we're at the part of our process where we want to take the inverse Laplace transform of um, both sides of this equation in order to get our little b of t. So when we take the Laplace transform of the left-hand side, b, we just know by the definition that's going to give us um, little b of t. So now when we focus on the right-hand side, um, to solve, to take the Laplace transform of this, we need to separate each one of these parts um, by dividing the, each part of the numerator by this denominator s plus alpha. <clears throat> and so that's what's depicted here in the um, second line. So now we're just going to look at an um, individual case in, of a sub n um, and then apply it to all of our a sub 1, a sub 2. But here we're taking the inverse Laplace transform of e to the negative a sub n times s all over um, the quantity s plus alpha. And so the way we can solve this is by separating our numerator from denominator and then letting this um, denominator be denoted by uh, a big F. We're going to let it stand for that. So the steps to solving this, um, first we have to identify F, which we did. That is equal to 1 over s plus alpha. Then we're going to take the inverse Laplace transform to get um, little f of t, which we know this by, the, again, the definition of the inverse Laplace transform. Then we're going to replace t with t minus a sub n, and a sub n is that shift in where the impulse occurs. And then we can multiply this f of t um, by our step function. And this is we're able to do this because we know that the derivative of the step function is the delta function. And that was the key step that we needed to, um, to use to be able to get our solution. So when we do all that, we end up getting number 27 on our Laplace transform, which is f of t minus a sub n times the step function, which is u of t minus a sub n. And we also know by number 2 on our Laplace transform table that f of t is actually um, equal to e to the negative um, alpha t. So we can plug that in to our top equation, and we get our final equation of uh, u of t minus a sub n times e to the negative alpha times t minus a sub n. And so then we plug that all in for each of our a sub 1, a sub 2, and a sub n all the way down. We get our final equation to be um, b of t is equal to this long um, series here. And so when we're looking at this in practical terms, what this was really telling us is that when we look at this first portion, um, this b of 0 times e to the negative alpha t, 
Um, this is just the initial dosage that's given to the patient. And this e to the negative alpha t is the decay of the drug after it's um, given to the patient. And then once we get a time where t is equal to a sub 1, the step function is actually going to turn on. And that's what this second um, portion of our equation is. It's turning on. And so the injection occurs. And then the exponential part of this function allows for the decay of the drug. And then we move on to this third component. And again, when t is equal to a, a sub 2, um, that's when this portion is going to turn on. And so essentially, we have an injection happening and then a decay, and then an injection happening and then a decay, so on, as long as the injections are given. So when we actually graph this b sub t, it turns out to what we would, what we would expect. So this first spike um, is when the initial dosage is given, and then we get a decrease um, right where the drug starts to decay. But when we get another injection, we see a spike occur, and then the decay is going to happen, and then so on and so forth until eventually um, no more injections are given and the decay just occurs until um, it approaches zero. So to conclude, we talked about multiple injection models and how we can manipulate um, ODEs in order to determine the amount of the drug at any given time. And by learning a little bit more about um, what these models can do, we can learn about how drugs can affect the way that we um, absorb um, and within our bloodstream. And this is really essential for effective drug administration and overall improving the well-being of the patient, which is what the ultimate goal is. Uh, so thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation.